We are at the top of the hour, which means it's time to begin a webinar. It is 2024, and we welcome you to the Lympha Press Educational Webinar Series. And we have a great webinar to kick things off. Let me do a little bit of housekeeping first. My name is Brenda Viola, and I am representing Lympha Press. I will be your host and moderator for tonight's presentation. The topic is utilizing pneumatic compression early for fibrosis management. And we are going to delve into the toolbox of the amazing and innovative Leslie Bell. Leslie has been serving the lymphedema community for over 25 years. She must have started when you were a mere child, Leslie. I know you did. That's but right. She was the creator of the Belize bra. She, oh, when I use the term innovator, it's you're gonna see for yourself some of the amazing tools and tricks she's come up with to help people manage their lymphedema. And you're gonna love the rules that she will share too. We know that we have both clinicians and patients in our audience and we welcome you. Let us know that you are here. Let us know where you're logging on from in chat. We enjoy the interaction, your questions, please do put them in the Q&A and we will address them at the end of the presentation. This is being recorded. We know you are going to want to refer to it again and again when the recording is ready for public consumption with graphics and all that good stuff that we do in the marketing team. We're going to post it on our website. It's going to be on YouTube and everyone who registers will receive a link to the replay. So that's housekeeping done here. We welcome you, but most of all, we welcome you, Leslie Bell. Thank you for presenting. This was presented at NLN last year and everybody was talking about it. And we knew that the content would be really important to share with a broader audience. So thank you. And with that, I'm going to disappear, but I got your back. I'm here to handle any Q and A and chat and all of that. Thank you, Leslie Bell. Great. Well, thank you all for coming tonight and spending a little bit of your um, evening with me. I really, really appreciate it. And I hope that I can share some information with you that might just make you think out of the box a little bit and give you some ideas. Um, I'd like to thank Lympha Press for inviting me to share these thoughts with you, and I hope that that you enjoy them. Um, I'm excited to share these observations, and hopefully this will help to expedite some of the challenging patients that you see and enhance your patient clinical outcomes. Um, like she said, my name is Leslie Bell and I live here in Vermont where it's cold and snowy and I love to ski and I, and I love it here. So I wanna tell you a little story about why I came up with this particular method. I had a patient who came to me probably 10 or 12 years ago um, from Maine and that's from, for you that don't know the area, she, that's about a nine hour drive from where I am right now because you have to go down to Massachusetts and back up. But anyways, she had called me before that and she asked me um, if I had a, a laser and I said, yes, I have a laser. And she said, well, I have, a t I have terrible edema in my arm and I wish they would amputate it. And anytime a patient says that to us with lymphedema, we just feel sick because certainly that isn't anything we want anybody to ever think is even um, an option or even consider for that matter. And when she told me about her particular edema, I said, well, I don't think a laser is really going to be your answer. If you're ever in my area, I'd be happy to give you a, give you a second opinion because she had received lymphedema treatment in another state. And so four months later, she showed up um, at my doorstep and I, she came in and she says, well, I'm here and um, I've taken out a loan to come see you and I'm staying at a hotel. And I said, oh my, she needed to take out a loan to come see me and I'm here for five days. So talk about having a little bit of pressure. Um, when I measured her arm, she had a nine centimeter difference between the affected side and the unaffected side and it had lymphedema for quite a long time. So anyway, with that in mind um, and that kind of pressure, I'm here for five days and thinking about someone who, who was that desperate that took out a loan to drive to Burlington, Vermont nine hours and see me, I'll show you now what I did to help her. I can't get the, there we go, okay. So as we all know, treating 
treating lymphatics is quite a challenge. And, and we see a lot of iterations of this problem in many levels of complexity um, with a lot of comorbidities from these patients, whether it's primary or secondary lymphedema. We have a lot of challenges um, giving our patients as much time as they really need. Treatments are getting cut. Time to treat these patients are getting cut. And with this in mind, I'd like to talk about some of the problems that we contend with. And so with that in mind, we respect and we understand and practice traditional treatment for lymphedema. Um, but what happens when the patient doesn't tolerate the traditional approach? What happens if they're not willing to um, buy in all the way for optimal treatment? What if there's more than one complication contributing to it? So I came up with these rules because it's really hard to, to give patients as much as they need sometimes. Um, and so my rules are this. Number one, we should not work harder um, or do more than our patients are willing to do for themselves. So I see and talk to a lot of therapists out there who are giving, 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 and sometimes the patients just aren't following through with quite as much as they need to, or they have, you know, some problems with motivation. Um, but anyway, so we need to remember that as therapists, it's not always our job to fix them 100% if they're not willing to participate equally. And some, number two is some is usually better than none. So we wanna do something to help them. Um, and sometimes just getting them started on this path is a good option for them. And rule number three is education, 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 and more patients and then more education, because that's what it requires to help patients make that change and be able to move forward in managing this lifelong condition. So one of the key concepts is that fibrosis is the result of the inflammatory process. All patients who have excess fluid hanging around for an extended period of time have inflammation. We see this in all sizes of patients, all um, in different sizes of edemas. And the patients who have minimal to moderate swelling also have stiffness and the pitting edema and some fibrosis probably. And these processes are really intertwined as Dr. Roxon says, and as lymphedema therapists, this is likely one of our biggest challenges is to reduce this thick edema and improve the fibrosis and then to help the patient maintain these changes after the initial decongestive process. This slide shows us that, that that cycle or that circle that goes on. So in lymphedema, lymphstasis results in an increase in pressure within the lymphatic vessels. And when this process perpetuates, the smooth muscle cells in the lymphatic vessels become slimmer and flattened. And the dermal capillary lymphatic vessels become hypertrophic, causing dermal backflow of the lymph fluid. The presence of this excess um, adipose tissue in the affected limb has been well documented in our patients with chronic non-pitting arm lymphedema following breast cancer. So our clinical observations show that hypertrophic fat lobules compress and collapse their feeding lymphatic capillaries, resulting in this vicious cycle of fluid and lipid transport disruption, which ultimately leads to further um, fat in the periphery. So see that cycle that is going around right here. Oops, go back. Oops. Hmm. Anyways, that goes around. You can just see that those uh, arrows that go around. So they all kind of feed off of each other. And that's what I'm trying to help you um, see in this slide. So the fibrosis challenge, again, thick and hard tissue. It holds the fluid in like a sponge. Um, we struggle with these patients a lot because that pitting just tends to refill. Um, reducing the fluid being held in the fibrosis improves the skin integrity, and it also changes the size of the limb. And we use foam for this, and we've been using foam for a long time, which is, which is a super helpful modality for us. Um, when we use it under bandages, um, we can exert as much as 50 to 75 millimeters of pressure with this foam. But we cut it into the right shape, or we make chipped foam panels, or we use channeling types of foams, and whatever we need, to help cover the area that's gonna be um, treated. But that's a challenge too, because some of these patients who we're trying to bandage and um, put the foam underneath the bandaging, it makes it a little awkward for that patient to move around, to walk around. Um, it's effective, but it's really hard on the patient to um, function that way. So this is just a little video, if I can get it to turn on. 
um, that was done by Haru Suwami's group. Um, and this is just showing how you can visualize the lymphatic fluid moving through the limb um, during ICG imaging. And this is an upper extremity. Um, but in this bright spot that you're seeing right here is from that, what we call dermal backflow. So when the fluid is not able to move through, you see this very bright area show up on the screen. Um, what they've noticed with this is that it takes a lot more pressure to move the fluid through these areas of bright light. And you can see a hand right there trying to move that through. Um, I had the great opportunity a couple of years ago um, when I was lecturing in Australia to spend an entire day in Dr. Haru Swami's clinic. And it was utterly fascinating to see how much pressure it really requires to move fluid through these more fibrotic areas. So when we do light MLD, um, it's not really moving much fluid through these areas. And uh, at the NLN conference um, last year, one of the things that um, Gunther Close came, got up and said was how much pressure it it's really required to move stuff through these thicker tissues. So I think that we can all feel good about applying that pressure and about doing it so much slower than what we're used to doing so that we can move that fluid out. Well, that's hard too, because that takes a lot of um, hand pressure. It takes, he was showing some, um, one of his therapists actually using their elbow on some of this thick and hard tissue. So we need to think about what are some of our other options to help patients um, get the changes that they need, but also to shave to save our hands. So here's our dilemma. You know, the gold standard is four weeks of of five times a day, uh, five times per week. I'm sorry, with one hour of MLD and then bandaging. That's great. If a patient could come in with a good diet and a healthy lifestyle, it would help us a lot. Having that nice, healthy skin that doesn't have any. Um, um, breakdown would also be wonderful if they had a caregiver standing by that could be helpful, make our lives great. And then if we had the ability to get all of the appropriate garments that they needed and the over-the-counter products that they needed and the bandages that they needed and the garments that they needed, that would also be great. And then if they had excellent compliance at home, life would be grand. The reality is, is that we have less time to treat these patients in the clinic. We have less number of treatment sessions available for the patient's to attend. Um, lots of them come in with some unhealthy skin. Um, financial restrictions or insurance limits are present for not only treatment, but also for garments. And there's truly just not enough of us around to treat these patients that need us. And then patients need tools to help assist them. So, you know, if we can find some, some optimal in there, it's always great, but sometimes we have to deal with the reality as well. And obviously our discharge goal is independence. At the beginning of treatment, sometimes we can tell which patients are gonna struggle and they may not be as successful with their self-management program. Um, they might struggle with the bandaging or to put on their socks or to use their garments or to use their Velcro appliances if that's what you think they're gonna need. And sometimes it's nice to look at a patient and know that you can actually make their life a little bit easier and help them succeed with this compliance. So one thing that might really improve the success is introducing them to pneumatic compression. And the lymphopress is just a great pump to do that with. Um, I have the option of having them try this in the clinic because I have these pumps in my clinic. And especially if it's, a th if it's appropriate at the beginning of the treatment, um, we can help them maybe reduce their um, fluid load faster, help to break down their fibrosis and pitting edema and give them an opportunity to assess whether a pump is something that will help them at home and um, help them with that independent stage of management. So some of the foams that we can use, here's just a smattering of different textures and different types of foam that are out there on the market. And we might use these for all kinds of different reasons. And um, they could be, they could be, you know, ones that they wear at night. They could be ones that they could wear during the day. They can wear some of those smaller pads under their bra or um, inside of a garment if needed be. Um, and so when this patient came into my clinic and had five days to improve with a nine centimeter um, increase, 
I thought, what am I going to do to make a change? And I had used um, a Comprex 2 jelly roll, which I'm going to show you a little later in the presentation. And I ended up putting that foam underneath the pump because I thought, how am I going to get this much fluid out and make this patient's money and loan that she took out to come see me worth it? Um, so um, we love foam. We use it all the time. We use texture all the time. I think texture is a great option. So if you're not using foams and textures to help your patients at home, I think that consider um, what benefit it might bring for some of them. So optimal bandaging pressures. Pressures of less than 20 millimeters have been categorized as mild, 20 to 40 is medium, and 40 to 60 is strong, and more than 60 is very strong. Interestingly enough, the average pressure loss within about a half an hour, well, 30 to 60 minutes under compression bandaging um, is about 25%. So how many of us send our patients home with bandages on and they fall off and I don't know, an hour or they fall down, especially when it's on the leg. So sometimes we use foam under the bandages to help those um, stick and stay up a little bit better. Um, but they, but there's definitely this initial change in their uh, their swelling early on. And then, you know, they maybe sometimes will put a bandage on over the top and tell them that they can then take that bandage off and tighten it up if they need to. But anyways, we know that there's a change. So, you know, our, the recommendations are to aim at achieving a, a sub bandage pressure of about 50 millimeters of pressure above the ankle, or maybe even higher if some inelastic materials are used. And that comes from Dr. Parch. Again, early um, pneumatic compression for early intervention. What will it do? It causes decompression or creates decompression. Um, it creates compression. Um, it's very good for helping to heal wounds or even prevent cellulitis. Um, again, easy for patients to use at home. There's a really high compliance rate with this. My patients really like it. And ultimately that reduces healthcare costs. So what's a damaging pressure? Well, you know, there's, um, if we review these really quickly, uh, Aliska said in a, that pressures that are under 60 millimeters of pressure are safe. So that's pretty good. Um, Ching said that there's no current evidence to avoid ipsilateral blood pressure readings with venipuncture. So that, that means that even enough pressure in an area to, um, to stop the pulse doesn't cause harm. So that's good. And that's also what Ferguson said. In 1992, Pappas demonstrated that there's no evidence of tissue damage with serial measurements um, of the muscle enzymes. Johansson demonstrated that higher pressures are more effective for fibrosis and created larger channels which facilitated uptake of the lipid droplets into the initial lymphatics. And Olchewski said that utilizing 120 millimeters um, of pressure for these longer treatments influenced subdermal pressures in fibrotic patients. So that's pretty that's that's pretty amazing. So we're probably not going to damage any of our our patients by using a pump and even using a pump early on. So here's a picture of my patient um, and how I use the compression pump with this jelly roll. So you'll see that, let's see if I can get my laser pointer to work. There we go. So you can see in this picture right here that that's a, um, it's about a five inch roll of Comprex 2 that I um, sew together because I'm a quilter. And so I have lots of sewing machines. But anyways, I cut it and I cut a Comprex 2 um, into five pieces and then I roll it up underneath the pump for the patient. And what I want you to see is in this bottom picture, and there will be more pictures coming um, in the later on in the presentation of the lines that are created by the pressure from this um, foam which is got a compression pump over the top of it, which I'm usually using at about 50 millimeters of pressure. So that's not unlike what we would get with bandaging. I usually have the patient's leg in it for, or arm, depending what I'm treating, for about 30 to 45 minutes. And I have my patients come in before treatment and have this done so that my treatment, my 45 treatments, because I'm in an orthopedic outpatient clinic that also treats lymphedema, um, so that my 45 minutes of treatment is then um, used educating the patient, bandaging the patient if that's what's appropriate, treating fibrotic areas if that's appropriate, 
dealing with little wounds, if that's part of the process, um, and then continuing to get them ready for independent management of this. And so I think of using the pump with the foam as taking down the initial water and so that the rocks start to show. We just take the that we take that fluid load down. And then when I put on their bandages, their bandages don't come off so quickly because I'm not getting that 25% reduction in the first hour or so. And um, we get more out of the bandages. So um, here is the picture of how I make this. So this is the complex two. The key on this, if there's any seamstresses out there, is we abut these two edges together like this. So I don't usually overlap them. I butt them, zigzag over the top a couple of times so that I get a really long jelly roll. And then I sew all the way around it, all the whole, all five of those strips. Because if you don't, then the fingers start to squeeze out. We use these in our clinic. We use them, we've been using the same rolls for years. Um, we wash and dry them all the time. If the patient um, comes in with sweatpants on, we'll just wrap the, over the sweatpants. Um, sometimes we put a gown around the patient's leg and we put the foam over that before we put the patient in the pump because we're always trying to keep our pumps clean. And so that works really well. So here are some, here's one a patient where I put Moby Derm on one side and Comprex 2 on the other, and I wanted to see the difference. And I think they both worked fine, but the again, I wouldn't want to put the Moby Derm in the washing machine because that's mostly made with tape. So the little foam um, nuggets or the little foam circles or squares, whatever they are, they work well as well, but I can't wash them all the time. And one of the reasons I like using the foam roll is because if a patient's coming in, I'm not ready to fit them for any kind of a garment that uh, a nighttime garment or a Jovi pack or a or any of the other different companies that have um, chipped foam pad products um, that they might use at night. And so if I'm if if I don't have a reduction yet, I don't want to uh, order them one. So using these foam foam rolls allows me to use this on a patient before I've actually had the reduction and I can see what the reduction is going to be. So that I think is really, really helpful. So here's a patient that I want, want to show you that wasn't, wasn't quite a perfect situation. He's an 83 year old male and he had stage four melanoma. Um, he was undergoing in, immunotherapy at the time that I saw him. And so he was going back and forth to different, uh, to different states between our state and another state to um, have that immunotherapy treatment. So I only got to see him maybe once a week or once or twice a week, and then he'd be gone for a week. And so I needed to teach his wife how to do some MLD treatment. But I was also concerned with getting the fibrosis down. And what I want you to see is that there is an enormous difference between this picture and this picture. So here you can see the one in the middle that's where I put the jelly roll on and you can actually see the lines. And the one thing that those lines do is they actually lengthen the skin. So you're getting this pressure and the undulation of that foam is actually stretching that skin and making that skin more pliable, which is helps that patient move fluid out better. And look at the difference between his calf here and his calf here. So he doesn't really have much muscle. He's probably doesn't have a great calf pump, which is another um, conversation. But um, but you can see that in only seven treatments between April 19th and May 9th, which is about three and a half weeks plus or minus, we were able to um, reduce his swelling by an enormous amount. He ended up wearing those um, the Velcro wraps because they were easier for he and his wife to use. And he had a 1400 plus mil ml difference between initial um, evaluation and the end of the treatment. I just happened to run into this patient about a year later in Costco, which is near my house. And uh, I asked him how he was doing. He was doing very well. And he pulled up his pants to show me that he was still wearing his Velcro wraps and was doing great. So there's a great success story. So for seven treatments, we got a pretty, a pretty good change, especially when those treatments had to be spaced out. This is an interesting patient who has severe um, vascular disease. I'm going to turn on the video here. Oh, I have to turn off the laser pointer just a second. There we go. 
Let's see. There it goes. Oops, he stopped. Let's get that going. Hmm. Well, I can't get him to walk right now. Anyways, you could just see him walking slowly towards us. And here's what I want to uh, what I want to show you as this this patient actually, if you look at how bad his edema is, which is pretty bad. I was quite concerned about that. His primary complaint was pain on the front of his left shin. He'd had a total hip replacement. Um, his therapist had taken him outside to walk with the home with home therapy. And from that time forward, for about three months, he'd had unrelenting pain in the front of his leg. And they had done tens of thousands of dollars of um, tests on him to see if he had clots or infections or anything else. He'd been on lots of antibiotics to, to make sure that he didn't have infections. And what I noticed when he came to see me is that he has so much swelling in the front of his leg and up the front of his ankle that of course he's going to have an inflammatory process going on. And I diagnosed him actually with um, um, a, a, a toe extensor tendonitis going up the front of his ankle because he actually kept telling the doctors that he had pain in the front of his toe. And so um, I treated him in the same fashion. You can see that on August 20th, I, I have a picture right there of using the jelly roll and using the pump. And at the end, um, and he wouldn't come in very often. So again, here's a patient who was not very compliant. Um, he's a busy guy and he takes care of his wife who's very ill. And um, he could only come maybe once a week. Sometimes he would skip, skip a week and he really didn't want to wear garments very badly. So I did, um, he did end up getting a pump at home and he ended up getting a jelly roll for home and he managed it that way. Um, he finally decided that he would wear some some Velcro wraps, um, but uh, you, obviously you can see in that la last picture that he also had a lot of swelling around his knee, and he um, was only interested in wearing a neoprene knee brace that he'd purchased at some time in the past. So he would wear the Velcro wraps and the neoprene knee brace, and then he would use the pump at home, and that's how he's managing it. And you can see his legs in that last picture. They don't look too bad. Is it perfect? It's not quite perfect, but it was managed and he was happy and um, his tendonitis went away. We also did an enormous amount of gait training with him because he needed to figure out how to find balance um, with walking without wagging his toe. And that if I could have gotten that first video going, you might have seen that as he walks, that big toe that's sticking up on his left side in that second picture, it just wags back and forth as he walks. So that's inter it's interesting that that's part of his balance compensation. So we had to learn how to get that toe down. We had to stretch out his toes and stretch out his FHL and um, stretch out his um, anterior tib. Um, tendon and muscle. And so that was all part of the treatment process. But um, again, he was managed well with his pump and um, his opportunity to use the jelly roll foam underneath his pump at home just enhanced the movement of fluid out of that area and kept it easier to manage. Here's Catherine and she had a DVT 43 years ago. And when she came in and I told her that I thought I could help her, she cried and she told me that it had been divine intervention that she had come to see me. So that always makes your day, doesn't it? So um, she had a lot of obligations with a family member. So I got to treat her 10 times in four weeks, which isn't, which isn't, you know, back to the, our, our traditional daily. And uh, she did agree to be bandaged. Um, one thing I want to point out here is that I am, I, again, back to my sewing days, You'll see that this picture right here, she's got some pretty colorful stuff on. And I show you that because when we use Artiflex underneath our bandages, Artiflex tends to get flatter and longer as we use it. And so um, I have a problem with that because then the patient, you have to put more on or it wears out. Um, and Artiflex is kind of expensive. And so I looked around and I said, why can't we use polar fleece? So going to a local fabric store and buying a yard of polar fleece costs about somewhere between five and $10, depending on if you get it on sale. And as you can see from this picture, I don't even care what color it is. And I can cut that polar fleece into strips and I can wash it. The patient can wash it. And it creates a, the loft that we need 
or the um, space spacing that we need, the softness that we need to distribute the pressure of the bandage um, much better. And so that's my trick in my clinic. We have yards of polar fleece and I cut it into the right um, width, depending on what I'm um, where I'm using it. And then you can see in the picture below here that she's got a full leg bandage on because she had this DVT again for 43 years. If you go over this page, you'll see that this left leg is quite a bit bigger, even up top than the lower leg. And I kind of had to make a deal with her um, and give her the option of using a knee high wrap um, and or using these tights. So we got her these um, over the counter uh, textured tights which also help with um, compression. And again, that texture helps to break down the, the fibrosis and the scarring in the skin. And so she would wear her Velcro wrap with that um, those textured tights. And then she had the option to wear them without the textured tights if she wanted to. But that's how she ended up being able to feel good about managing hers. And um, she's pretty happy with that. Then we have Steven and Steven came in. I'll see if I can get this video to play. Hmm. Oh, there we go. And Steven um, is 68 years old, had swelling for over a year in both legs, but the, um, the right was much worse than the left. The biggest problem with him is he tends to sleep sitting up in a chair due to, due to his chronic his um, chronic back pain and the failed fusion. His ankles are the most fibrotic and the most scarred ankles I've ever seen. His pain is extreme, nine to 10 out of 10 um, in his toes because a surgeon at some time in the past decided that because he had hammer toes that he should have surgery on his hammer toes. So now his toes don't move. So now that his balance is really impaired, He's got toes that he's trying to use for balance, which aren't working well because they're already, he's trying to hammer his toes um, through the hammer toe surgery. So he's just got this extreme pain. Um, he needs a total shoulder replacement. You can see that arm kind of hanging down on the left side, but they don't want to do it until the swelling is better. So Steven is, is a real challenge. So let's look at the next slide. So here he is, um, and this is probably one of my more dramatic pictures. You can see, get back out my laser pointer. You can see that when we started, his legs were, they're not horrible. They're not the biggest legs you've ever seen, but look at how much thinner they got. So he actually doesn't have much muscle either. Um, but the, the exciting thing was, is that we did a thousand ML change in two days of treatment. So we reduced the fluid out of his legs enormously. And, um, and then we got down to the scar tissue, which we were which we're still continuing to treat. And that's what's been a real challenge. So now it's been a couple of months since I've been treating him. And his wife does the bandaging. We've tried it numerous times to get him into either Velcro. Well, to get him into Velcros, we haven't tried garments yet because he can't get them on over his ankle and his feet that hurts so much. So, but, but even with that, his, his, um, his swelling has stayed down in his legs. His ankles are somewhat improved. They're not perfect, but they're better. But you can just see how thick this ankle is right here. This is much, much improved. But again, now we're down to scar tissue. Um, so, and I can't get him out of his chair. So then there's, you know, there's the reality of it. I can't get him to, to lay down. He's trying to increase laying down, but it's not happening really fast. But four months later, his reduction is still present. And now we're going to work on the other problems that we've got. And we're working on strength and balance and gait. And again, more scar tissue in his ankles. Um, I put those bottles up there because the userin bottle is about 500 mLs. So that's so we got 1,000 mLs out of each leg. And then our water bottle next to it, which has the name of my clinic, Timberlane Physical Therapy, um, has that's a 1,000 milliliter bottle. So that's just an enormous change for um, this patient in a short period of time. He also has a pump at home and he is also using the, the jelly wraps at home and that just helps to keep his legs under control. So again, seven treatments in seven, uh, seven treatments in three weeks. And um, you can see how his, um, his Go ankle- ahead. Move that ankle now. You can hear what he says. He will tell you. Now move your toes. Look at how much toe motion he's How much got. better does it feel? 
much better. I mean, 50%? Oh, yeah. More than 50%? More than 50% 50% better. My ankle's probably close to 75%. Ankle's more than close to 75% better. So that's pretty good for seven treatments in three weeks. And I also use laser on him, so most of us use a lot of different treatments on patients as well. But his ankle pain is 75% better. Oh, you can see. There we go. Now you can see is how much the other ankle is moving, which wasn't very much. So... Why use a lymphopress pneumatic compression? Well, because there are lots of different, there's lots of options for home management for these patients and it makes them feel so much better and it helps them with control. Um, Lymphopress has a variety of different um, appliances that these patients can use that that will um, help them to manage their different problems, their different problems. Um, and it works for the venous patients, the venous insufficiency patients. It works for the lymphedema patients. Um, it works for the patients who can't reach their feet. So, um, you know, we have sequential, we have wave um, uh, settings on on the uh, on the machines for the patients to use. And also on the optimal plus machine, the patient can actually manage the type of compression that they're getting. Um, by their phone, which makes it really nice for those patients that can't reach very well. Notice these nice overlapping chambers, the nice overlapping chambers here, which just keep a more consistent pressure on for the patient because um, it doesn't allow, if there's a seam or something, then sometimes the the fluid goes up in there. And so this is very nice for um, keeping a more consistent overlap. There's lots of um, ones for the upper extremity. We really like this one a lot because it zips up and the patient has really wide zippers. I think that's one of the things my patients enjoy the most is that there's a big ring and it's very easy to move these zippers up and down. And again, you can see the very nice lines that we got on this patient's arm and um, that helps this patient manage much better. She also has one at home. So pneumatic compression accelerates the reduction phase. Um, There's a pre-treatment for manual therapy modalities. Um, It uses some of the MLD pre-clearing techniques, especially when you get the the part that goes up into the waist or the jacket that goes across the body. Um, Starting with the higher pressures can be really helpful, especially when you're using foam underneath it. Um, Again, in the clinic, we always cover the skin with clothing, a pillowcase, a gown, something like that to keep the inside clean. And then um, we avoid constriction um, with bunching of elastic garments. So that's really helpful for patients. So again, discharge goals. We want to help our patients be successful, manage their lymphedema. We want them to have a comprehensive home management program. Um, and pneumatic compression is a powerful and effective home treatment that helps these patients control lymphedema. But it's also a powerful um, tool at the very beginning to help us move through this um, fluid process and then figure out what is this patient gonna need at home. And again, since we are all running low on time and we're all running low on numbers of treatments based on insurance limitations, and also it's saving our hands. You know, the deeper pressure that's required with a lot of these fibrosis patients um, is is really hard on us as therapists. So if we can get these patients in um, for some pneumatic compression, then uh, before we treat them, then some of the heavy lifting's already been done. And finally, I wanna say thank you. This is Vermont in the summertime. That's the lake where I ride my bike. And um, I hope that y'all have a great evening and I look forward to talking to you more and please feel free to ask any questions. Yeah, thank you so much, Leslie. I was taking furious notes here and you brought up so many great points and really interesting ideas to help patients manage their condition. I can only imagine as a therapist, and I'd like to know in our audience, who are therapists and who are patients? If you can just put therapist or patient in the chat, I'd love to know who we are talking to here. It's gotta be so frustrating when you do your hands-on work only for them to not maintain when they go home. And so that's why the lympho press is such a great answer. It is. Yeah. So we have several patients definitely in the audience. And I hope that you are using a lymphopress. If not, by the way, please do reach out to us through the website, lymphopress.com. We'd love to help you. You mentioned a few things. One, 
was that keeping the pumps clean is important. And I think that's a distinguishing factor about the lymph press because of the material. Mm -hmm. the, the, the material is um, very easy to clean. Um, it doesn't hold on to bacteria and residue. Um, you can move, use different types of sort of in, industrial type cleaners on the inside and you're not going to hurt the fabric. It's very durable. Yeah. So that's really important. And then to have a patient who refused to be bandaged it happened. and, you know, your hands are tied. It's so nice that you have something to offer them that they will be compliant with. Mm -hmm. And it's nice to be able to show them the changes. So I've had patients like lipedema patients who come in, they also do well with the, the foam and that helps to reduce some of the thick and sometimes they're kind of a spongy feel and sometimes their tissues get a little thicker, especially as they get more congested. Um, yeah. So using the foam with the lymph press is very helpful for them too. Lipedema patients do quite well with the pump because we know that it's not an enormous amount of fluid we're trying to get out, but even getting out some of that fluid, my patients walk out who have lipedema saying my legs are so much lighter. Um, mm. They're so much more comfortable to walk. Their knees bend better. So it's, it's really helpful for the lipedema patients as well. I do see some comments from folks that do have lipedema. We're so glad you joined us tonight as well. Irene Steffens out there and she says, I love my lymphopress, but we love that you love it. That's awesome. We have a couple questions that have come in that I'll just raise to you. Ted B, thanks for being here tonight. He says, can you speak to the instance of leg sleeves causing, causing fibrotic tissue in the lower abdomen? He just had this happen to himself and he's looking into a full leg with abdominal coverage. Uh, any, and by the way, we do not diagnose during these webinars and certainly Leslie would probably need to see you to give you an educated answer, but off the cuff, is there any broad brush answer you could give? Yeah. Well, you know, you know, one of the things that we assume when we put on a um, leg sleeve that goes up to the top of our leg is that our lymph nodes in the groin are going to take up this fluid and move it through the abdomen and up through the the torso and into the left neck. We just assume that's going to happen. But for some patients, you know, there could be many reasons that it's not moving out of that area. They could have had pelvic surgery. They could have pelvic radiation. Um, you could have um, a primary lymphedema where, you know, your anatomy isn't allowing for that. <clears throat> and so, if you only put a leg sleeve up to your leg and your pelvis can't move this fluid out, then that would could cause congestion and tightness and um, um, fibrosis and thickness and firmness of the skin. And so in the case where the trunk isn't moving it out, that's where the, maybe the trunk lymphopress would be very helpful. And also working with a lymphedema therapist who's going to make sure that you're doing your breathing correctly. So there's another whole aspect of breathing that's really important with helping to move fluid out of the torso and the trunk and create a siphoning effect. So make sure you check in with your friendly neighborhood lymphedema therapist and see yeah. if we can't help you with better breathing. So ribs moving are very important. Diaphragmatic action is really important because that is our suctioning and our siphoning effect that tends to pull it out of our trunks. So I hope mm. that's helpful. In a that is, rushed way. Yeah. And I think it's important for people to know that there are Garmin options and you did raise this during your presentation, but I just want to underscore for lipedema, whenever I see a lipedema patient and because I know the trouble spot that happens in the hip area, yeah. just the leg sleeve is not going to be sufficient to give the kind of relief that we know is possible. You mentioned eliminating the heaviness. And what I hear from lipedema patients is that achiness that is the pain associated with lipedema is so often reduced by the it pneumatic. Is very often. And I think it's I think it's the reduction again back to inflammation. That when the inflammation, even if it's not the largest amount of fluid that um, some of our patients might hold on to in the lipedema patient, it's enough to create an inflammatory process in the skin and the subcutaneous tissue, which is really painful for a lot of these patients. Yeah, and one more note, for the larger patient, we have the pod. The bod pod, the, the bod pod, pod rocks, by the way. 
I love, I have a bod pod in my clinic and I can treat patients of all shapes and sizes, no matter who walks in my door. And it yeah. is such a phenomenal um, tool to have. So um, I recommend it if, if the patient is the size that a bod pod could help. The other thing is that the bod pod comes up much higher. So the bod pod actually comes up right to sort of the upper part of right below the breasts kind of area. Yeah. And that is um, that is very helpful in facilitating that fluid out of the area. There's literally not a sized person that we can't help with pneumatic compression. Sure. So don't despair. Patients out there ask, we'd love to work with you. The lympho pod is like a sleeping bag that you can just mm -hmm. zip up. You don't have to be very mobile to make it happen but it will give you that compression to get you. What we want is what you said, independence. We and you can move it from your phone. So if you are in that sleeping bag, you get your yeah. phone out like this. Oh, there's my grandbaby. Oh, she's so cute. I knew you were. You just wanted anyway, to photobomb us with your grandbaby. I know you did. Yeah. All right, let's go. Phone yeah, so, to yeah. change you settings can. and to turn it on and off, which is so convenient for people. It really is. So you can be playing words with friends and then turn on your compression at this, just flip the, the same switch time. There, right there. So Shannon Doyle dial, I'm not sure if I pronounced your last name correct, but we're glad you're here. She says, do you find that lipedema patients need to have less frequent treatments after initial decongestion than primary lymphatic venous post-op patients? Um, Yes, I would say yes. And that's, again, back to creating a home program for patients. So because we're not there, the initial decongestion is not going to be quite as, as large a volume with a lipedema patient, um, because we've got that, you know, adipose tissue component that's, that's um, along with it. So they may, they may not need to be treated quite so often. And with a lot of my lipedema patients, it's a lot of education, back to education, 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 because if I can help them come up with a home program that's going to work for them, they may not need to see me very often. And I might just be a resource most of the time, but I am available if they do. But that is my primary focus is trying to get patients with the right equipment, the right support, the right, if a pump is appropriate, let them help them to acquire that, you know, what is the paperwork we need to do? Um, you know, which garments are going to be best for their particular, particular condition? Um, what can their expectations be? So, you know, exercise, again, a really important aspect of all treatment for lipedema and lymphedema patients is exercise. I do a lot of gait training with patients. You'd be surprised at how many patients who have had very stiff ankles and very stiff legs for a long time don't even activate their calf pump. And that's our very strongest pump in our body is the ability to move that calf and pump that fluid because that's what pumps it out of our legs. So I might have to spend time with ankle flexibility, mobility, foot and toe motion, knee motion, you know, strength training. So there's so many things that we can offer a patient and that's where our treatment is very personalized and, um, and specific for what the needs are of the person in front of us. Gosh, it was about four years ago when I started interviewing lipedema patients. That's when the Optimal Plus was really yeah. coming to the market in the United States. And we knew it was indicated for the treatment of lipedema and I interviewed a patient who had been told years ago, don't exercise, this will exacerbate your condition. Right. And something instinctually rose up inside of her. Her name is Patty Cornute. You can find her on the internet. She is on our Lipedema Roundtable. And she now runs a group called Lipedema Fitness. And they are doing amazing things with their body because remaining mobile and active and having quality of life is everything. So I'm it's so everything. grateful that you mentioned that. Good stuff. So compression, Shenandoah also has another follow-up question. Do you recommend the active compression pants such as those from Solidia? Lower yes. pressure, but the texture is supposed to promote fluid movement. Uh, it's magic. I love those pants. I love the Solidia pants a lot. And I find that 
the um those that particular brand is nice because what it does is it gives you lots of stretch up and down and more compression going sideways so that can be really really helpful so as you saw that the, the patient that you saw um earlier in the presentation who had the velcro on the bottom and the tights on that's what she actually had on excellent all right this is your chance, audience. If you have any more questions for Leslie Bell, please put them in the chat. Are there any common misconceptions that people have regarding pump usage? Well, I, I hope I dispelled most of them. I think the biggest one is, is that they're dangerous. And I don't think that they are. I mean, that's why we went over the literature at the beginning, you know, showing that a blood pressure cuff puts on more pressure than a pump does. Um, and bandages band i mean we don't hesitate you know for appropriate bandaging and a pump's not going to put probably any more, more pressure on than a bandage and sometimes when you again when you get to use the pump first before you're bandaging if you're going to do this at initial evaluation or initial decongestion um those bandages work better because they don't fall down so you get longer lasting um compression and 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 the working pressure that happens with bandages so i would say that that's probably the biggest um misconception that's kind of been lingering around for quite a long time. And I but, love that you address the pressures issue. Higher pressures actually are needed when you're dealing with needed. the product issue. I mean, I can tell you the NLN, Gunther showed some pictures. Gunther, for those of you that don't know him, Gunther Close um, owns um, one of the lymphedema schools and his presentation, he had a lymphedema therapist using her elbow and leaning in and holding it there for like 30 to 60 seconds. And, you know, again, if we think about the cycle times for a, a pump, that's about what it is. You can cycle these, you can change the cycle times as you need them. But I mean, if you can hold an elbow into a fibrotic tissue for 30 to 60 seconds, I can promise you that a pump's gonna be more efficient um, mm -hmm. and something that you can reproduce at home. One final thing before we close, cause I know time is fleeting, but it's not just the squeeze, it's the complete release as well that is unique to the lympha press. Not all pneumatic compression is created equal and the lympha press not only can get you those elevated pressures, but why is the release so important? Because that's when you get the refill so that you can push it up further and then refill and then keep pushing it up further. Right, so it allows for the refill so that you can move that fluid out. And next so, thing you know, you're gonna need to go to the restroom, correct? That is right, and if someone says they have to do that when I get done, I think touchdown, we've achieved our goal. Achieved our goal. And again, the goal is independence for patients and we know nothing makes you happier therapists than for your patients to get better. And that's what we're all about here at LymphaPress, not just physically providing the equipment, the pneumatic compression therapy to treat your condition, treat your patients, but also following it up with support. Webinars like this, roundtables for patients, we're here for you. You're not alone. We care. And we appreciate you, Leslie Bell. Thanks for being here tonight. Thank you so much for having me. And I hope you all have a great evening. And thank you for spending some of that time with us. Yes, I agree. Thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful night. See you Good next night. time. Bye-bye.